in Washington, D.C. for joining us and of the U.S.-Japan policy community. Of course, I want to welcome our president, president and chairman of Sasakawa Peace Foundation, uh, Dr. Satohiro Akimoto. As many of you know, uh, Sasakawa USA worked closely with our sister organizations in Japan, most notably the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Today, we have a number of fellows and others from the Sasakawa Peace Foundation Tokyo joining us. Again, it's very late in Tokyo, so I want to thank you and welcome you for joining us. Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA is dedicated to deepening the understanding and strengthening the relationship between the US and Japan, mainly within the Asia Pacific context, placing emphasis on security and diplomacy. So this Pacific Trident tabletop exercise perfectly fits our mission. Uh, Joy, if you could put up the agenda slide, we'll talk about that first. So this is what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to start with uh, an overview of the TTX scenario from Admiral Blair, who designed it and designed the entire series. Uh, the report, our report writer, uh, Admiral Mike McDevitt, is also going to talk about uh, the findings. We're going to hear a view from Team USA from Ms. Kelly Magsman and a team a view from Team Japan from Mr. Kanahara. Uh, we're also going to hear a few additional insights from TTX players, and then we'll have a moderated Q&A. Admiral Blair will moderate a Q&A with the audience, and I'll talk in just a second about how we're going to do that. Okay, next slide, please. So I want to remind everyone that today's webinar is on the record uh, with, with so many people. Now, I understand that maybe that's a little complicated considering the fact that we, we're always very careful that we don't announce uh, uh, the players from our tabletop exercises and a number of them are on. So it's completely up to you whether you want to identify yourself if you ask a question or, or something like that. But today's record or today's webinar is on the record and it's being recorded. Um, and then how we're going to do the Q&A. During the Q&A period, I'd like all of you to please use the question and answer tab at the bottom of your screen. You'll see it's essentially uh, like a chat format, but it's different than the chat button. Uh, I think the chat is probably disabled for most uh, attendees. So go to the Q&A tab, you click there, and then you can enter your question. And then Admiral Blair is going to look through those questions and, and either answer them or pick possibly another TTX player to answer them. Um, one thing, if you're not familiar with the Zoom Q&A function uh, that you may notice is that you can actually promote a question or you can give it sort of a thumbs up. Uh, so if you have the same question, you could do that. And if we see that a lot of folks have the same question, that might be a good way to do it. Okay, so let me int introduce today's speakers. Um, Ms. Kelly Magsman is Vice President for National Security and International Policy at American Progress. Among other positions in government, she performed the duties of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs. Mr. Nobukatsu Kanahara is professor at Doshishu University. He has held numerous government positions in, the na in national security, including uh, Deputy Secre Secretary General of the National Security Secretariat. And Rear Admiral Mike McDevitt is a retired U.S. Navy flag officer and a senior fellow at the Center for Naval Analysis. He is the writer of our TTX report and the previous TTX report. And of course, our moderator is Admiral Dennis Blair former commander of U.S. PACOM and director of national intelligence. Admiral Blair is a former chairman of Sasakawa USA. He conducted the TTX as a Sasakawa USA distinguished senior fellow. Again, before I turn the floor over to Admiral Blair, I want to remind everyone that this discussion is on the record. Admiral Blair. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Chris. Um, this was the fourth in a series of tabletop exercises sponsored by Sasakawa USA over the past several years to, to develop insights on the potential future challenges to the US-Japan alliance. The previous three TT, tabletop exercises had all talked about a single challenge. Two of them were from North Korea. The, th the third exercise was from China, centered on the Senkakus. This exercise, in contrast, was designed to test the United States and its allies against a challenge from China that was spread across East Asia, from Korea down to the South China Sea. 
We had experienced teams of former officers and officials. Several of them are on this uh, webinar uh, with us. They play the roles of the national security leadership of the United States, of Japan, the Republic of Korea, and Taiwan. The China team was played by a group of American China experts, and the control team played the rest of the world, which included North Korea, Russia, and the Southeast Asian countries primarily. The scenario was set to begin in August of 2020. It lasted about three months and it was played in four moves of about three weeks each. At the start of the game, Xi Jinping had instructed the Foreign Affairs Leading Group and the Central Military Committee of China to form a diplomatic, economic, and military plan with the objective of demonstrating China's superior military power across the full region with the design of weakening U.S. alliances and relation relationships, in addition, making territorial gains in the South China Sea. As part of that guidance, Xi Jinping instructed that China was not to provoke conflict with the United States and its allies, so it was always to leave itself a way to de-escalate and not to cause conflict. The China team had made a secret agreement with North Korea. The DPRK agreed to undertake provocations that would draw U.S. military reactions to the North, but not to start a conflict. In return for economic and diplomatic support from China, as well as a partial security guarantee. So that was the planning done before August 1st of 2020 when the game began. When the game began, a North Korean commando raid took place on Kunsan Air Base that succeeded in destroying a US F-35. The team evaded capture, made it back to the submarine that had delivered them, but left one body behind. I know that uh, General North was signed up for this seminar, so I must apologize to him. In uh, 2000, when I was commander in chief of the Pacific Command, I visited the Kunsan base and then Colonel North, who was the commander, took me on a full tour of the extensive U.S. and ROK defenses against, uh, against uh, irregular attacks, and they were very impressive. However, I'm sorry, Gary, but uh, the uh, North Koreans got through this time uh, in, the, in the game. So that was what was going on in the North. In the South, meanwhile, China took advantage of a typhoon in the South China Sea to land a People's Armed Police Coast Guard force, no PLA forces, on the Taiwanese administered island of Itu Aba, also known as Taiping. Ostensibly, this expedition was to deliver aid, humanitarian aid, but actually it was to occupy the island. The Republic of Korea team, guided by its proactive deterrence posture, planned a 10 ballistic missile attack on the North Korean submarine base on its west coast. But it was talked down from that plan by the US team to a one missile attack shot off of North Korea's east coast into the water. Meanwhile, Combined Forces Command in, in Korea called for reinforcements and implemented several flexible deterrent options, or FDOs. Meanwhile, the Indo-Pacific Command surged forces, two carrier battle groups, the Japan-based Amphibious Ready Group and Marine Expeditionary Unit, submarines, and Air Force fighter squadrons. Japan, for its part, increased its force readiness, and when North Korea put its entire submarine force to sea, Japan deployed anti-submarine warfare forces in strength uh, in international waters in the J Sea of Japan East Sea. Taiwan, for its part, prepared a force to recapture Taiping. However, the United States declined to provide support to that expedition, telling Taipei that it would it would negotiate with Beijing to secure the withdrawal of Chinese forces from the island. As the game continued, China sent a 200 strong maritime militia and fishing fleet into the Senkaku's contiguous zone. The Japanese Coast Guard, which was reinforced for the purpose, managed to handle that incursion without incident and the Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, slowly withdrew their force. 
At this point, the action in Northeast Asia around the Korean Peninsula shifted to a diplomatic phase. A North Korea-South Korea meeting reached an agreement in which North Korea expressed regret about the Kunsan attack without res assuming responsibility. It agreed to a moratorium on long-range missile launchers and a resumption of talks on denuclearization in return for a reopening the Kaesong industrial complex and a series of family reunions. North Korea was elated that it had escaped further sanctions while China, uh, while China and Russia were busy lightening the burden of existing ones by a series of borderline economic actions. And really the action for the remainder of the game shifted to the South China Sea. China sent a small force to take over Dongsha or Pratis Island. This would be their second South China Sea island occupation. This island again is claimed by China and Taiwan. The US team was focused on a direct negotiation with China to, con to convince it to withdraw from Taiping and Pratis. To strengthen its position, it sent Marine, a Marine force to the Philippine occupied islands of Thetu and the second Thomas Shoal in the Spratlys. China was happy to keep diplomatic communications alive, but in the meantime, it sent a task group to occupy and develop Scarborough Shoal. So as the game ended, there was an agreement for a summit meeting between Xi Jinping and President Trump to discuss these, this crisis. China felt, the China team felt that it had achieved its goal of expanding the number of features it occupied in the South China Sea. It now had forces on Abu Itu Taiping, Dongsha Pratas, and Scarborough Shoal. However, China had failed in its objective of splitting the American alliances and in fact had strengthened them as an unprecedented level of communication, policy coordination, and even combined military action developed among Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and the United States. Although none of the other four country teams ever learned of the secret Chinese decision and the secret agreement with North Korea, all four countries soon saw in the game that this, wide flung, that this widely flung Chinese aggression was a threat to all of them, and they joined together to deal with it in a very cooperative fashion. Although China had deployed impressive forces into the South China Sea, so had the United States, and the US resolve to use those forces was increasing throughout the game as China appeared unwilling to make any concessions or to return to the status quo. So that was the overall play of the game. There were many fascinating issues and insights in each of the four game moves, and they're described in detail in the game report, which you have. But I will leave them for the discussion period. And let me turn now to Admiral McDevitt, who is the chief observer and author of the exercise report. Admiral McDevitt. Uh, thank you very much, Admiral Blair. Um, and good day to all of our uh, participants and listeners. Um, I'd like to do uh, one big shout out to the uh, Lighthouse team of uh, Lockheed Martin and the data collection that they provide in that facility, because without that data collection, I would have not been able to uh, put together the, uh, the report. The key findings, uh, first of all, uh, Admiral Blair already mentioned, but China had hoped to drive wedges in the U.S. alliance structure, and, and con quite frankly, what happened was the reverse. As China's assertive actions and North Korean and, or, and, and inspired uh, North Korean inspired uh, act activities, uh, the result was exactly the opposite that China had hoped to do, and drove the U.S. and its allies, including and its friend. Uh, unofficial uh, ally Taiwan closer together. The second major point is that this, I have had the good luck to uh, write uh, the reports on all four of the trilateral uh, uh, TTXs that we've done. Uh, and uh, in each case, uh, trilateral US Japan ROK consultation and coordination was absolutely essential. And that was exactly the case again in this one in this exercise. Um, almost from the very beginning, uh, inspired by a, uh, the Japanese team's recommendation, uh, the US-Japan uh, decided to expand the Alliance Coordination Mechanism, the ACM, to include the uh, Republic of Korea. 
uh, through a secure uh, VTC network. Now we made it, the game made it a lot easier to do than it probably would have been in real, in the real world, but nonetheless, it demonstrated the absolute, the, how important uh, having uh, this sort of a trilateral uh, coordination mechanism that was in active, uh, uh, in action, and was es essential to uh, quick uh, responses to uh, the unfolding scenario. Uh, the Chinese aggression against Taiwan held islands uh, created an interesting and important uh, uh, political dilemma for all of the uh, teams uh, because the United States, uh, uh, the Japan, Republic of Korea, uh, had all signed, have all in our diplomatic processes agreed to a one China understanding uh, with Beijing. Uh, and in fact, though, uh, as the aggression against China, uh, Taiwan occupied islands uh, became manifest, uh, it became clear that as soon as people were starting to deploy military forces, particularly Taiwan deploying military forces when they uh, announced that they were uh, going to try to recapture Taiping, it became obvious that uh, it was necessary for uh, all of the uh, interested parties in the region who had forces deployed to begin to discuss and have coordination uh, and activities with the Republic of China. Uh, and it's, it, that is, that is uh, something that's going to exist uh, if, in the real world if uh, the U.S. Uh, in support of the Taiwan Relations Act uh, requires to expand uh, to uh, militarily respond to Chinese aggression. So one of the things that uh, came out very clearly was it's a, a, the U.S. is encouraging Chokyo and Seoul to establish peacetime political and military uh, uh, networks or contacts with Taipei uh, and plan for contingencies. We recognize that this is very, very controversial, but nonetheless, it also is a fact of life that if things do get exciting uh, in the Western Pacific uh, involving Taiwan, uh, it's going to have to be taken care of. Could I have the next slide? Uh, and the fourth uh, key finding was, uh, and this is a complicated one, and I encourage everybody to take a look at the written report, but our, the existing U.S. position of taking no position on sovereignty can, uh, claims in the South China Sea, uh, it once again demonstrated it uh, undercut U.S. moral authority. Essentially, China just blows off U.S. Uh, comments and, and uh, threatens, threatening uh, language and what have you and ignores it and has done that for many, many years. And so uh, one of the findings is that China, Washington should really take a close look at this, uh, taking no position on sovereignty claims in the South China Sea. And there are possible alternatives. There's a legal uh, approach called uti posidatus, which means everybody hang on to what they have, uh, that could provide an alternative. And finally, uh, on this particular point, Washington uh, and others uh, should, uh, should recognize Philippine sovereignty over Scarborough Shoal. I think if anybody takes a close look at the legal merits of the case versus China's claim versus the Republic of the Philippines claim, uh, it will become clear that Philippines, the Philippines have a, have a much stronger legal uh, uh, case in their terms of Philippine sovereignty, sovereignty over Scarborough. And finally, uh, the game revealed, uh, while it didn't have a lot of Southeast Asia play, it revealed that between Tokyo and Washington, there needs to be a broad understanding on what the strategic, respective strategic objectives in Southeast Asia are. And this, this should be a matter for both of our governments to, to take another look at our combined diplomatic, economic, and military approaches uh, to Southeast Asia with the, with the goal of how do we counter, how best is it to counter Chinese uh, influence? And then with that, I'll conclude my comments. Thank you, sir. Over to Ms. Magsman.
Great. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you, Admiral Blair, and thank you to Sasakawa for putting together this uh, fantastic uh, Pacific Trident exercise. I thought it was very interesting and, and uh, useful <laughs> to many of us. Um, I will start with a few things. One is I just want to give a little bit of a sense of the rationale behind uh, US strategy in the game. Um, and then I'll give you a sense of the takeaways um, that I, I at least had um, given the play. Um, so first is we really made a uh, early decision uh, on Team USA to prioritize the situation vis-a-vis -vis China and the South China Sea as opposed to the Korean Peninsula. And so you saw that play out uh, in terms of you know, really focusing on de-escalating on the peninsula, uh, working through the Republic of Korea on the diplomatic side. Um, and that was uh, intentional um, on our part so that we could focus more around the issues that we were facing in the East China Sea and the South China Sea uh, during the game. Um, second, I would say, you know, our, our goal was really um, to try to deter Beijing from um, further moves on Taiwan. Um, and we were working really to hard to try to essentially alter the status quo to give ourselves some leverage um, to negotiate a diplomatic outcome. So you saw that play out uh, in our sending the Marines onto T2 uh, and uh, the second Thomas Shoal. Um, it also played out in our expansion uh, around the T Taiwan Relations Act um, and some of the statements we made on US-Taiwan relations. So we're really trying to essentially build up some leverage with the goal you know, ultimately of getting to a summit meeting with Xi Jinping uh, and President Trump uh, I think that if we had had one more move in the game, it would have been interesting to see whether or not there was any way to find a negotiated outcome at a summit. We didn't get to that uh, move at the end of the game, but that was really the, the broader strategy behind uh, the things that we were doing uh, in the Pacific. Um, finally, uh, you know, we really focus a lot on ensuring strong alliance coordination, especially uh, trilateral uh, diplomatic and military action. and um, we actually thought, and we were pretty proud of ourselves <laughs> uh, to get the sort of combined uh, transit, naval transit uh, between the US, ROK, Japan, and Taiwan. We thought that was a pretty significant uh, shift um, and signal to Beijing that its strategy was going to be undermining them in the long term um, in terms of the cohesion of uh, the US alliance structure uh, and integration of Taiwan into that uh, structure. Um, we also were real, working really hard to ensure that we had uh, a, a very geographically distributed force posture um, in the region for flexibility to give ourselves the ability to flex um, in the situation. We were very focused during the game on uh, the Chinese submarine force, frankly. Um, and so a lot of our uh, military coordination, uh, especially with Japan uh, and Taiwan was around um, the, the concerns around the Chinese subforce um, being completely deployed. Um, but I will say uh, there were challenges and there will be challenges in a situation like this where you have potentially uh, you know, widespread distributed crisis um, that there'll be questions of sustainability of American presence um, over time. Um, there will also be questions of you know, whether you know, when you have to actually move presence, there's political impact and strategic impact um, that will have to be managed um, in a crisis. Um, my main takeaways, um, you know, I think like Admiral Blair said and Admiral McDevitt has said, you know, our allies really remain central uh, to our ability to execute our objectives um, full stop. And we really wouldn't be able to operate uh, and affect any real significant outcome without them. Um, the second takeaway is uh, China clearly links uh, action in Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia in ways that the United States does not necessarily in both a policy structure and sort of a, a force posture structure. Um, we often treat them almost as separate theaters, um, as many on this call uh, know, um, separate issue sets. Um, and it's very clear that China has a, a different outlook um, on some of this and they link their actions in ways we don't. Um, I thought throughout the game uh, that our collective responses were focused far too much on uh, military options and really underutilized diplomatic and economic options. I think in part that was 
uh, the result of the players of the game largely coming from uh, various defense establishments. But I really do think um, that that is an area where I think U.S. policy needs to do some thinking that's, you know, try to get out of a purely military response to some of these scenarios. Um, on occupying features in the, in the South China Sea, which is definitely uh, controversial, um, U.S. putting Marines on T2 Island would be a serious move. Um, but it was also, I found both on the Chinese side and on the U.S. side, it was a, it was a rapid ticket, ticket de escalation as opposed to de-escalation. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it needs to be thought about carefully um, in the context of a crisis. Um, I also believe that uh, high level diplomacy between the United States and China is going to be absolutely essential um, to, you know, negotiating in a crisis like this. We weren't able to get to a summit, but it would ha we'd have to have much more uh, direct high level engagement with the Chinese uh, to land uh, this crisis in a better place um, than it did. That said, I will also say that I think what China, you know, China may have gained some additional uh, features um, change from status quo, but I really think from a strategic place, they really kind of undermined uh, the sem themselves with respect to sort of broad alliance coordination and uh, recognition of Taiwan. I mean, we were we were integrating Taiwan much more directly in our uh, military conversations and coordination mechanisms um, than I think <laughs> Beijing would have been comfortable with in, in, in real life. So I actually think they came out in not a good place um, in the long term in this game. Um, and finally, this didn't come up in the in the remarks earlier, but I want to flag that throughout the game there was uh, a lot of disinformation um, used by various players, uh, whether it was China, which was aggressive about it, um, or North Korea. And I think we have to be prepared um, as a, as an alliance um, to really uh, be ready to deal with that challenge, um, whether it's you know tweets. <laughs> or uh, statements that are misleading. Um, I, I think that is gonna be an area of, you know, sort of gray zone and potentially, you know, not gray zone warfare coming, you know, going forward that I don't think we've done enough real development of US and ally approaches to. Um, and I think I'll just leave it at that. Um, thank you again to Admiral Blair and, and the Sasakawa team uh, for organizing such a great TTX. Over to Mr. Kanahara. Oops. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. I wish to thank in particular Admiral Blair and Takimoto san and all the Sasakawa USA members for this splendid TTX Trident 3. I want to make several points today. The first one is the importance of the coordination of Japan, US, Korea, and possibly Taiwan, and next time with Australia. The coordination in the TTX among Japan, US, Korea, and Taiwan was excellent. Unfortunately, much, much better than the reality. And a small concern here. The US Pacific Alliance system is called the hub and spokes in the Pacific. It is based upon the bilateral alliances, not like NATO. The reason should be that the US allies are all islanders except Korea. The main U.S. bases are in Japan, the 7th Fleets, Air Forces, Expeditionary Brigades of Marines are all in Japan. And these U.S. forces are and were supposed to defend not only Japan, but nations, regions beyond Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines. This was the original idea of Japan-U.S. alliance in 1960. During the Cold War, this framework was, was effective Japan was facing Russians and Korea was facing North Korea. China was a partner since 19, late 1970s after the Vietnam War. There was no threat in the South to Taiwan. Now with the rise of China, our strategic focus was shifted to the East China Sea, South China Sea and Taiwan. China's rise is because of their industrialization and this power shift is real. To cope with this new situation, Today's U.S. alliance system, hub and spokes, could be fragile. China can touch and bully any American friends and allies in the East South China Sea at the same time, and we are still divided. This TTX showed that Japan, U.S., Korea, and Taiwan, and next time with Australia, should coordinate in a more robust way to meet the challenges that rising China poses to all of us. 
Any contingency cannot be handled with effectively without daily coordination and co-exercises readiness of the parties. China is a very good Sun Tzu student. They attack when the enemies are least ready and the least united. My second point is the U.S. should show, at least uh, in a very quiet manner to the Allies, the strategy for the South China Sea. Japan and Korea have formal alliances with the U.S. We have common plans and core exercises. Japan and Korea believe that the U.S. will use strategic nuclear weapons to, to deter any possible nuclear attacks from enemies. Northeast Asia is clearly under U.S. defense perimeter. But for many agents, the commitment of the U.S. to the security of the Southeast Asia is not clear, in particular, South China Sea, and Taiwan is the most fragile. Japan owns, Japan owns these Bratry Islands during the Pacific War. They were called Xinan Islands. They were Japanese islands. And some islands were handed over to Taiwan, of course, because it was Taiwan Islands, because Taiwan is Japanese islands after the war. Taiping Island is the most important one. It has a bit shocked me that U.S. team abandoned Taiping Islands so easily to the negotiations between Taiwan and China directly. I was prepared to face the possible contingency, not in the, not in the peninsula, but in the, in the South China Sea. The reason is very simple. The Taiwan is more vulnerable, and we believe that the USFK and Korea could maintain the status quo because they are stronger than, South, than the North Koreans. So we agreed to the tactical accommodation of North Korean, I mean, North Korean demands for a Kaesong industrial complex reopening of these things. But South Korea, we believe that they could handle this with the USFK. Taiwan was helpless in the South China Sea. And the US cannot leave alone Taiwan to the negotiation with the Chinese simply because China dictates the negotiations without US oversight. Smaller nations left alone to the mercy of China are simply hopeless. I have to add that in such a case, China always said to your friends and allies that you, Americans will, not, will never come to help you simply because we are talking to Americans and China is more important than you to the Americans. And this information is quite effective. To erode US reputation in the region, the US should have a strategy to defend what and how in the South China Sea. And the Americans should not have to say that openly, but you, at least you have to share the strategy with the allies and friends. The presence operation and freedom passage operation by the US Navy the, its credibility could easily be damaged when you surrender the islands to the Chinese picking, free picking of these islands. The third point is about Senkaku Islands. Admiral Blair asked me after TTX, why did Japan not react to the, the audacious Chinese provocations? My answer is very clear. The situation around Senkaku Islands these years changed drastically. Before our Coast Guard vessels were chasing Chinese Coast Guard vessels, they were in and out of our territorial sea of Senkaku Islands. It was seven years ago. Now it's very different. Beyond these Coast Guard forces, the PLA, SDF are looking at eye to eye at each other. And this, the, the tension is very high. We believe that China will not escalate very easily because if an armed conflict happens, it's not like Indians and Chinese in the Himalayan mountains. On both sides, thousands will die instantly. And this is Senkak Island situation today. We don't push them and they don't push us. And we believe that the tension is quite high and they don't escalate very easily. That was my reading. And the, finally, I want, to, to, I want to appreciate very much the comprehensive approach of US team. We have to learn a lot from that. The, so-called dime, diplomacy, information, and the military economy. It was the Americans were coordinating these aspects comprehensively and very easily in a short period of time. And they take very good decisions. This is what our NSC cannot do, not yet. We have to learn a lot. You can maneuver your military forces to send diplomatic messages to the enemy's military forces that could reach the leader. 
and this is that we have to we have to learn from you some some small small comments um maybe two or three one is china uh, will not relieve north korea and north korea has to be on the orbit of china uh, we should remember why mao zedong did not invade taiwan they came to korean peninsula in the korean war simply because korean peninsula is so close to beijing they cannot afford losing it and korean peninsula was under chinese influence for 1000 years and japan took it russia was there we are out now americans are having the southern half of the peninsula and the northern part is with china and they can never relinquish it and we have to always think of Chinese interests and North Korea cannot move out of it. And the technical issue is the Americans were talking about the, the position on territorial issues in South, South China Sea and East China Sea. You don't, you never interfere the territorial disputes, but territorial dispute is one thing. Changing the status quo by force is a very different thing. If somebody challenges to change status quo by force, even with the police forces or militia or fishermen whatsoever. This is an invasion. And this is not a matter of the title. This is a matter the, against the obligation of the peaceful settlement of the disputes. And people must be united against that. Otherwise, big ones can do anything against the small ones. Uh, these are my, my points to make. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kanahara-san, uh, both for those very good comments and for your play during the exercise, you and your teammates on the Japanese team. Uh, we're lucky enough to have some of the other uh, game participants uh, who are on the call, and I've asked a couple of them to say a few words because uh, their viewpoints are important. Uh, Roy Camphausen, you were on the Chinese team. Can you give us a few insights from uh, playing, uh, playing China? Thanks, Admiral. And it was a privilege to be a part of this scheme and to learn from our other participants. Uh, let me make three quick points. Uh, from uh, the China team or the China perspective, recognizing that we were Americans playing the team and our interest is in helping the United States be a more effective uh, in its responses to these sorts of challenges. So the first point is <clears throat> there are at least two enduring and I would argue immutable PRC advantages in the maritime domain uh, off the Asian, in the Asian littoral. The first is geographic. Put simply for the China team, it's a home game and for the United States, it's a way game. Longer lines of communication and, and all that as we know. The second is that by virtue of not having alliance relationships that it must tend to reassure, encourage, and otherwise interact with, especially earlier, early on in a contingency or a crisis, the China team has, the China side has much greater freedom of action. And these combine to, to create a, a situation in which in any sort of scenario, China can act earlier and more quickly to change conditions or, and even alter the status quo. We have to bear these, these two enduring factors in mind. The second is that the second point is that while the report judges that the PRC did not quote break any alliances, this should not diminish the fact that the China side did achieve real changes in the status quo that could likely only be rolled back through serious American pressure or leverage, perhaps even the use of force. Indeed, this is the essence of China's longstanding salami slicing tactics or gray zone activities to achieve marginal gains that don't provoke a strong response. For further insight on this point, I'm, I'm grateful to my China team colleague, Yun Sun, who argues that the US definition of, quote, breaking the alliance is very different from the Chinese definition. The reference points are very, vastly different. Indeed, because China is the one trying to challenge and undermine alliances, any sign of US inaction, such as with Taiwan early in the game, or any sign of allies neutrality or hesitation, such as by the ROC or Southeast Asia countries, will be seen by Beijing as small victories toward achieving that goal. We can hardly imagine a scenario where one big event makes allies fundamentally break away from the US, but it is the constant process of erosion, attrition, and frictions from doubts and disappointments that thin out the elasticity and credibility of the alliance. 
one last and final point in the form of a policy implication for the US team. Swift decision making and decisive early action are imperative for the US to prevent PRC achievement of incremental goals that run counter to US interests, lest the much harder rollback option, potentially including the use of force, becomes necessary. In this sense, the, the Japanese approach in the Senkakus, as described by Kanahara-san just a few minutes ago, can really be instructive for the US. Thanks again for the opportunity to be a part. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Roy. Uh, the, uh, you and your colleagues on the Chinese team uh, really played a good, uh, a good hand in a testing way. Uh, we also are honored to have uh, Admiral Li Simin on the, on the line, former uh, Chief of Defense of the uh, Taiwan Armed Forces, who played on the Taiwan team. Uh, Admiral Li, a, a couple of observations from the Taiwan team's point of view. Okay, and thank you, thank you, Admiral, for giving me uh, this opportunity uh, to share my thoughts with uh, with you, you all. First, I would say the, uh, the this, this scenario is indeed a very uh, good chance to test Taiwan team. I thought the Taiwan team was just a supporting role in the first places, but the in fact that the uh, my teammate Sherry Ken, Sherry Ken and I were always busy dealing with uh, tension and uh, dilemmas. And uh, hopefully Taiwan team has put some uh, positive effort to the exercise. But from the observation of myself during the uh, exercise, the, uh, I felt that the uh, China team since that they act much tougher than the US teams. The, uh, because they, for the Taiwan team to dealing with the, uh, the, the like a Taiping Island is not uh, easy to have so many friends friendly uh, nation together with us to deal with China. So we we wanted to, to take these opportunities. But however, to be very frank, we were always disappointed as you can, when we uh, got the answer from the uh, U.S. when we uh, when we when we uh, proposed. However, I do agree that the uh, Elmo uh, McDavid's finding that the, we should encourage the Tokyo and the Seoul to establish the pitch time political and uh, military network with Taipei for contingency. You know, in reality, we have tried this for many, many years but never be successful. I believe the, uh, the let's never, that, that is impossible we can make it if we, uh, only Taipei initiates to uh, to establish this kind of mechanism. I believe it's a still needs U.S. to 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 lead in establish this kind of uh, network. But the, uh, to the look at the future of the exercise, I would suggest that even we can design the scenario to be even more critical. For instance. If there's a war across the Taiwan Straits where conflicts are right around the seas and the airspace of Taiwan, and Taiwan seeks for support from uh, US-Japan alliance, and while being in the decision-making process, then Taiwanese pilots asked in the air to land on airfields in Japan's southwest islands, such as Miyako or Okinawa US base, because of all the Taiwanese airfields are destroyed by a ballistic, ballistic missile. Then in this case, how will US-Japan allies respond? Reject the request or grant permission for landing but detain the assets or supply it, resupply it and the ladies take off to fight again? Whatever decision the U.S.-Japan alliance makes, it takes different consequences. I'm not sure if such kind of a scenario was exercised before. However, how U.S.-Japan alliance would respond in a scenario like that Taiwan is the first point, this kind of decision-making process is worth thinking again and again, because this kind of scenario is highly possible to happen in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 
Admiral Lee. I'm, I must tell everyone else that Admiral Lee has an unfair advantage in, in exercises because uh, when we first met 15 years ago, he was director of the Joint Exercise and Training Command. And so he had the job of, uh, of uh, conducting uh, command post exercises for all of uh, the Taiwan Armed Forces. So he spent a lot of time worrying about uh, future scenarios and, I, and your ideas, uh, Admiral Lee, on, um, on the difficulties of, uh, of uh, conflict around, around Taiwan are very, very good and something we should consider. Um, also playing on the Japanese team was, uh, was uh, Nishi-san, who was, uh, uh, has played in several of our war games. I don't know if he is on the a line, but, line, but uh, Nishi-san, do you have any, uh, any comments from, uh, from your point of view? I guess not. I guess not. So let me uh, finally then uh, turn to uh, another uh, American who played on the U.S. team, um, uh, Ambassador Shear, Dave, David Shear. Uh, we heard uh, Kelly Magsman's uh, comment that uh, perhaps this was an over-militarized U.S. response. Uh, you have experience on both sides of the uh, State Department Pentagon uh, divide. Uh, could we, do you have a a few insights, uh, David. Well, thank you very much, Admiral, and thanks to Susquehanna Peace Foundation for hosting this terrific game. I have a couple of takeaways, including on the subject of uh, militarization of our approach to the region. Um, but I'll start with um, a first takeaway, which is the strategic inseparability of Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. Kelly mentioned this in her remarks, and I, the 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 game emphasized for me the fact that the Chinese view the Western Pacific as a single strategic chessboard, if you will. The U.S. doesn't often do that, and it hinders our approach to crises like these. A second um, takeaway that I, I had um, is pointed out in the report, which is the asymmetry of security structures uh, between China and the U.S., and between China and its allies as, as well. Um, the U.S. has lots of forward deployed forces in Northeast Asia, we have strong, capable allies, and we know why we'd go to war. In Southeast Asia, it's quite the opposite. We, we can only use deployed forces, which are difficult to sustain, as is point, pointed out in the, um, the report. Uh, we have much less capable allies, and we're not quite sure why we'd go to war. And I think we have to decide uh, under what circumstances we might go to war before the crisis breaks out. Third, I think, um, and this is related, the extent to which gray zone, taxes, uh, gray zone tactics undermine traditional deterrence. And I think it's an urgent task for not only the United States, but for the US, Japan, and Australia at a minimum to figure out more ways of deterring gray zone tactics um, in the Taiwan Strait and in the South China Sea. And this is not just a, a military problem. It's a problem of uh, regional diplomacy. Um, and fourth, uh, I think we need to discuss further with our Japanese and our Australian allies, and perhaps our ROK allies, exactly what their interests are in the South China Sea. We discovered uh, that Japan is, is very strongly committed to Taiwan in the course of this, this exercise. Um, I'm not sure to what extent uh, uh, Japan shares our interest in the South China Sea. And I think that's something we need to clarify with the Japanese. It's possible that Japan thinks the South China Sea is more strategically important than the U.S. does. Um, and that's also something we sh should discuss. But um, any approach to the South China Sea isn't just a military question for the United States. It's not just a force posture problem for us or a strategy problem for us, as Kane Harasan suggested. It's a problem for primarily all three of our, our uh, of these allies, the US, Japan, and Australia. And I think it's an urgent, it's an urgent task for the this alliance to, to uh, get ourselves diplomatically and military deployed in Southeast Asia in a way that bolsters traditional, further bolsters traditional deterrence. 
No, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Shearer. That those are those are good uh, good insights and, and recommendations. Um, for the remaining time that we have uh, available, a little over half an hour, uh, as as uh, Chris Rodman said at the beginning, uh, we are using the Q and A Q and A function to pose questions to uh, to our our panelists. I'm looking at the the Q and A board now and don't see any. Uh, open questions. So while you're thinking about them, I might take advantage of uh, some some others who are on the line, who are uh, in who participated in the game and who have been thinking about these issues a long time. And if I I first might call on uh, Dr. Satu Lemay, who played in the control team, the role of all of the Southeast Asian countries, Vietnam, the the, the Philippines. Uh, Thailand and so on, and he was involved in um, in um, in many of the uh, dis discussions. And uh, Satu, uh, we've we've had discussions about uh, so far about the uh, need for tighter definition of U.S. policies in in Southeast uh, Southeast Asia, in the South China Sea, and in, in particular, uh, a combination of uh, different countries there that you played. Can you? Perhaps uh, make a few comments on uh, on this um, this issue. Yes, well, uh, thank you, Admiral, and thank you again to Sasakawa Foundation for the opportunity to participate in this very interesting exercise. Um, I have to say, echo the comments of a couple of uh, folks already, uh, including Ambassador Shear um, uh, and Roy Kamphausen. Uh, the first comment is, I myself, uh, working on the control team on Southeast Asia, was surprised by how quickly Southeast Asia became incorporated into the wider uh, situation and the Chinese pressures. Uh, the second um, was, um, I felt that while the Allies were very constructively engaged in Northeast Asia, um, I found that Southeast Asia could easily complicate and delay responses of allies coordination in Southeast Asia. And that was a big takeaway for me because we are very well practiced and well versed, I believe, over the last 70 years in Northeast Asia contingencies. But I felt in Southeast Asia, we were less prepared and less clear about what the outcomes would be which allowed China to press uh, forward. And the final point I'll make is that it is interesting to me, uh, given the uh, pressures uh, about Scarborough Shoal, uh, how important uh, it's a reminder of the importance of the Philippine-US relationship uh, and alliance, and also for um, a much a uh, deeper dialogue with our Southeast Asian allies and partners about what they would be willing to do, uh, quite apart from our treaty allies in Northeast Asia, in such scenarios, meaning our strategic framework agreement with Singapore um, and other partners in the region. What access would be available? What diplomatic support would be available? And I felt, and I believe uh, Kelly Maxman uh, referred to this, that their role even on the diplomatic and other fronts would be an important element of our response under such conditions. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. No, thank you. Thank you, Dr. LeMay. And uh, I, I agree that, uh, that a future game should play in a much more granular fashion a South China Sea scenario in which we have separate teams from Singapore, the Philippines, Vietnam, as well as our Northeast Asia uh, teams, uh, in in order to really get at some of these uh, issues. And in fact, uh, Gregory Poling, who runs the very fine uh, CSIS uh, program about China Sea, has posted a question uh, in which he asks if uh, he could hear a little bit more about the decision to deploy U.S. forces on on Ditu and the Second Thomas Shoal. Uh, how did the team can envision convincing Manila to accept such a move, why would the Philippines accept the significant escalation risk? And uh, in the game, this was in fact a, um, this was in fact a, a point of, uh, 
of a strong negotiation between the U.S. team on the one hand and and uh, Dr. LeMay playing the uh, the role of the Philippines on the other hand. So I might ask uh, 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 Kelly Maximan if you if you want to talk about uh, how you saw it from the American point of view, and then we'll circle back to Dr. LeMay again um, to uh, to uh, talk about the Philippine point of view because this was not a this was not an easy uh, easy or smooth uh, decision. It was uh, it, it was uh, worked hard by both sides. So uh, Kelly Maximan, you might start. Yeah, sure. Um, and let me just first say, I think, you know, obviously there's an artificiality to the to the way the game is constructed. Um, I think these these conversations in real life would be actually much harder <laughs> um, in terms of convincing Manila uh, to take these steps um, during the game. Uh, we did have engagement with the Philippines around these decisions. Um, and, you know, frankly, I, and Satu probably has a better memory than I do of this, but there was a little bit of back and forth and I think confusion um, between us about what uh, we were going to do in this space. Um, but our view at the time was essentially trying to build some leverage um, and also create a status quo advantage to ourselves um, that we thought the Philippines would be in support of. That said, I think the Philippines um, uh, under current leadership is a little bit more unpredictable <laughs> uh, in this space. Um, and I think in reality, uh, these these kinds of moves would be a much uh, tougher sell uh, in Manila. But I defer to Satu on this. Yeah, Dr. LeMay, you were, you were not an easy, you were not easily convinced of, of, of this, I know, as you played the role of the Philippine government. Uh, what, what was your uh, approach to it? Oh, have, have we lost uh, Dr. LeMay? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm, I'm. Go ahead. Let's see. Joy, is, is uh, Dr. LeMay Sorry, unmuted? Um, How about now? No, I've unmuted him. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I guess I'm uh, sorry about that. Um, as, as Kelly said, I, I think quite rightly, I, I mean, I, the, the Philippines position as things began to move into South China Sea and Southeast Asia, I felt that it would be more accurate to depict how much Southeast Asia could slow down decision making, but how crucial it was to have their input on decisions. And second, I really want to emphasize and underline that point, which is goes back to my earlier one, why it's so important to start having discussions with Southeast Asia about what they would be willing to do under contingencies early on, because I don't think it would be easy at all to move the Philippines to do these things, especially now, but even under the best of circumstances, because I think there would be a lot of quid pro quo. And I tried to reflect that, Kelly, as you may recall, particularly given the current government in the Philippines. And I don't think we can take it for granted that we will be able to do the things we want to do um, and, and, and we think should be done. So I, I just, I would reflect the same, same view. Right, and, and as I observed the game also, just one other comment. Remember there was a progression. There was Abu Thitu, which um, had a humanitarian uh, cover story, which took a little bit of a while to uh, to uh, uh, to un uncover, and then there was then there was Dongsha, and then there were the others. So I, I think the none of the participants were really sure how far China was going, and resolve tended to stiffen as the uh, as the uh, it was clear that that China was uh, scooping up some uh, some features. Uh, I think. Uh, also, many people in the game had an education on the geography of the South China Sea, which uh, they hadn't quite known well before. I mean, the, the, the most heavily populate, populated Philippine island is within sight, 10 miles of the, of the uh, Chinese uh, island, and Abathito is only about uh, 30 miles away. So, uh, so some of these specifics made a, made a difference as uh, as well, but it was a gradual realization that that uh, China was going to be taking this aggressive action. Uh, we, we have a, a question from Tokyo from uh, Ogawa-san uh, asking 
if uh, Japan's maritime self-defense force ship I Izumo were in the South China Sea, uh, what assistance would the U.S. team have asked for, and what what would been have been the likely reaction for the J Japan team? Um, uh, let me uh, let let me uh, again ask uh, Kelly Magsman, who is our Secretary of Defense in the in the game, um, if. Uh, if there had been the availability of stronger Japanese forces actually in the South China Sea, uh, would they have been, uh, uh, would have been a good idea from the US point of view to incorporate it or, or them? And then let me ask uh, uh, Kanahara-san uh, what the Japanese reaction would have been in the game. So Kelly, first to you. Um, well, it's, I mean, it's hard in retrospect to say, but I would say um, from my perspective, having Japanese presence um, would be extremely valuable um, in part just from a, a presence perspective and a, a deterrent perspective, um, but also in terms of maybe alleviating some stress on U.S. Uh, Navy posture that was, you know, we were pretty widely distributed at that moment uh, in the game. And so I don't know what specific requests we would make other than sort of presence over, you know, over the horizon uh, uh, kind of uh, approach, but um, certainly I think in general, the U.S. would welcome as much Japanese uh, naval presence as, as they would be willing to offer. Uh, Nobu Kanahara-san. Let's see, uh, Joy, can you unmute, unmute uh, Kanahara-san? I see his lips moving. There Sorry, we go. Thank you, yes. And Ambassador Shear asked the question, how important the South China Sea is for Japan? I have said socioeconomically, it's bigger than the Mediterranean. This time is square for agents of the sea. This is very important. Our sea lanes to Europe, to, to the Gulf, to Australia passes pass through there. That's a very much a traffic heavy area for everybody. As for the defense matter, our responsibility after the Pacific War was always limited up to Taiwan. The Philippines co-defense plan with the Americans to defend the Philippines, never talked about it. And this is a very new situation. I have said in the peacetime, our Navy is a blue, blue water Navy. They go everywhere. They're very often, long time in the South China Sea. And this is something what we do. Presence operation is fine for us. But this kind of true contingency, how to respond, then then the you know, ad hoc cooperation is fine just for showing presence in these things. But beyond that, we need the coordination cooperation readiness. Otherwise, it's too risky. We can't commit forces without knowing what we are doing. And there, on defense matter, we need more close cooperation. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's very difficult to answer this question. Oh, th thank you very much. Uh, Sorry, too frank, maybe. <laughs> No, no, that's what TTX is for. We're not in government anymore. So, uh, so uh, there have been a couple of questions from Russell Xiao about uh, the tension between the United States and Taiwan and this in in this game. Uh, specifically, uh, why did the United States uh, decide not to support the Taiwanese plan to retake uh, retake Taiping? Uh, and um, this was a this was a big theme in the game. I, I'm going to ask uh, Kelly Maximum to comment also, but I can I can make a few uh, comments. The uh, as everyone knows, the U.S. Uh, security guarantee to Taiwan is a is a conditional uh, security guarantee, conditional in circumstances, but it also uh, has some geographic limitations. Uh, for example. It's a it's a matter of open policy that the United States security guarantee to Taiwan does not uh, does not cover uh, the offshore islands Kinmen and Matsu uh, specific specifically it does cover Pungu the islands that are much closer to uh, closer to Taiwan now that's that's dependent of course on on what else is going on at the, on at the time but at least those two geographic questions uh, have some have been discussed in, in American uh, policy previously and, and have come out that direction. The Taiwanese claimed islands in the South China Sea were sort of a new area, which are, which are not, uh, which are not uh, covered in openly available 
uh, openly available American announcements. And so we were, we were poking into, uh, in this game, we were poking into uh, areas where uh, th there is policy ambiguity, and, and those are really the best places for tabletop exercises to, to, uh, to go because they, uh, they, they can expose some ideas. Uh, so um, let me ask uh, Kelly Maximin to, um, to uh, give us some thinking into the U why the U.S. team uh, told uh, Taiwan or discouraged Taiwan from uh, a military force to regain uh, Taiping. And then let me ask uh, Admiral Lee to comment on, on uh, what he thought the consequences and uh, what his thinking was. Thank you, Admiral Blair. Um, well, to be candid, I think um, in part we were trying to play a realistic scenario under the Trump administration. Um, but putting that aside, um, you know, I think there is, we were trying essentially to, as I said, widen the scope of um, our building our leverage um, and trying to get to a diplomatic engagement with, with uh, Beijing. And we're trying to de escalate a little bit on that front, but, or escalate to de escalate. But I, Part of it was a little bit of just wanting to own the initiative in the space. Um, we did uh, uh, insert a SEAL team, I believe. I think Admiral Greenert's on this call somewhere, but um, um, but we did, you know, did send a clandestine team um, to the island. We were trying to essentially control our own actions in that space um, and not necessarily be led into something that we weren't prepared to respond to. Um, and so that was part of the rationale. Um, and we also thought we were going to be successful in getting, you know, sort of with the occupation of T2 and second Thomas Scholl, really putting pressure on Beijing in other places that matter, matter to them um, as well. So that was our rationale, um, clearly imperfect, clearly created a lot of challenges between uh, the United States and Taipei. Um, but at the same time, we thought we are, from our perspective, we were doing a number of things, whether it was engaging the ROC, you know, with other allies on the military front that we thought were pretty significant, you know, like the transit, doing uh, the big legal, we had a big legal um, uh, play that we made to basically acknowledge uh, Taiwan's, you know, sovereignty over some of these things that, you know, the U.S. hasn't uh, in the past done. So. We thought from our perspective, we were doing a wider play um, that we wanted to control the initiative on. And that was really most of the rationale behind it. But there were other, there are other clearly players on, on this call who might want to chime in on that. Let's see, I, be, before we get to the US players, uh, Admiral Lee, uh, you were asking, as I remember in the game, both for some specific uh, military assistance, primarily in terms of reconnaissance and intelligence and other forms of support, as well as as well as political support for Taiwan's planned retaking of Taiping. Is that correct? Yes, we, we did re request that, Steve. We, of course, we want to regain the Taiping Island. However, we consider that the uh, uh, two things we have to solve before we uh, take any action. The first is the capabilities, yeah, because we need the uh, United States help to uh, to, to supply or, or, or suitable uh, vessel like uh, LHT to bring our force on, on the, uh, on the uh, Taiping, Taiping Island because that's not difficult because the only Coast Guard on the island, so it's not difficult to take it by forces. Secondly, uh, because that we are the kind of a coalition, so we have to respect that the, the United States the, uh, the decision. However, we, uh, we, we, we were disappointed because the uh, United States has the, his own consideration like uh, the Katie, Katie say, said. But however, the, 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 the action that the, uh, we, we took, like a uh, joint patrol through uh, Taiwan Strait or other things, the, uh, the, the, finally it uh, shows that China didn't take it. So uh, the, one of the consideration that the United States want, they want to maintain the status quo, but I, for my, myself, I got a different point of view because the uh, China will we, never talk with the kind of a group of country like United States, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, they will ne not fight with us. So this is a good chance to change the status quo. And the new status quo is uh, 
can provide the benefits to the to to the United States, Japan, Taiwan, and so on. We should take this uh, advantage to take it, but not so uh, so con conservative. Just wants to maintain the status quo. So then finally, we prove that China thing is so so tough. They never. Then they never considered to 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 retreat the anything from a uh, Taiping Island. So maybe uh, we should uh, reconsider for the uh, kind of a sim similar situation. That is my my opinion. Thank you. Uh, thank thank you very much, Admiral Lee. I, 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 if you've read the uh, report of this exercise, you you see that we tried to address this idea of how realistic. Uh, was the aggressive play by the Chinese team in this exercise. And, and because all of our, our players are experienced uh, uh, former officials or academic experts in the, in the region, um, it, I, I would say, frankly, that it took all of them a while to change their, change their thinking and, 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 uh, and try to deal with a China that, that was acting in a much more aggressive form than we have seen China act uh, to date. Uh, the, the initial, the initial yeah, hope was that China was taking one small action and, and, and would be happy to negotiate uh, and return to the status quo. And, and then China took another action and another action. And I, I, I think it is a question of, of whether China in the real world would take the, would run the high levels of risk that uh, were, shown, were shown in this game. But, uh, that, that's really the function of tabletop exercises: is, is to try uh, different strategies by your competitors, by your by your potential uh, enemies, and see see if there are any weak points they can find, if there are things that they can exploit. So I I, I do think that um, I do think that on the particularly on the side of the U, U.S. team, not so much on well, it was on the side of the U.S. team with regard to China that there was a certain uh, slowness, I think, in recognizing the aggressive course it was on. Uh, but by the same token, it was interesting when the uh, when the game started with a North Korean attack on Kunsan Island. There was a sense of disbelief in the Korean team. They thought North Korea would never do that, um, uh, and it took them a while to uh, realize that, and and then to and then to take their reaction. In fact, we're lucky enough to have. Uh, now, General Inbun Chun, who played on the um, North Korean team, and uh, General Chun, uh, if you are there and Joy can un unmute you, perhaps you can uh, uh, give us some insights from the uh, Korean Korean point of view on on what you saw. And you also are a veteran of several of these Pacific Trident games. Um, I do not see his uh, username online. Oh, okay. Yeah, he, he was there, sir, but I think he may have dropped off either intentionally or, or not. Oh, that's right. It is, it is late in, <laughs> it is late in uh, Seoul. Uh, yes, sorry, in boom, uh, to call on you. But, uh, but, but I, I will say that, uh, again, this, this adjustment to a change in North Korean behavior, the, uh, the attack on Kunsan, the, the um, action that they took, did take a while for the, North, for the South Korean team to process, uh, especially in, in uh, Playing as they are now, the uh, a, a, a Moon gov government, which uh, feels that it's making uh, some progress with its understanding with North Korea, there were there were several questions uh, that came up in the um, Q and A session about uh, a more detailed role for some other countries, whether India was involved, whether uh, Thailand uh, what was involved, uh, what about uh, Singapore, what about Vietnam, and let me just answer those. Uh, Generally, by saying we we simply did not um, we did not uh, have granular play from uh, those countries. We talked more about uh, Southeast Asian countries in general, and of course, as we've discussed, uh, the Philippines uh, had to make some individual uh, individual uh, decisions. But um, uh, in this game, we did not we did not really involve uh, an strong Indian participation or other Southeast Asian uh, countries. I'm, that would be a, a word, that would be a, uh, a task for a, a, future, a future game. Um, let's see, we had one, uh, 
we had one loose thread, didn't we, uh, Kelly Magsman? You were going to ask somebody else on the U.S. team about. Uh... Yeah, Admiral Greenert has his hand up um, oh, yeah. and, and might be interested in, in commenting. And so oh, does yeah. Ambassador Shear. Admiral Greenert and then Ambassador Shear on the, um, on the uh, South China Sea questions. Thanks. <clears throat> Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, this, uh, from the military perspective, getting back to the Taiwan piece and then a little bit about what Kelly described, uh, our actions uh, down in the, uh, in the South China Sea around the islands. Kelly said it exactly right, but I guess from a military perspective, I would say this ambiguity in policy uh, led us down a path where the president was telling us don't you get me in a war with China over this thing. So that led us to say, okay, what are we gonna do with these hostages? Let's see what it would be like if we tried to go in there. How difficult would it be there for the SEAL team? Uh, let's stretch this out a little bit and see if we can't get diplomacy somehow with China to convince them, how about you taking these blue hats or whatever you call these people, they were claiming them to be blue hats, if you will, on the island, off here. And this would really uh, kind of quiet this down a little bit. And so bottom line, we were buying time because we didn't have really a policy. And the president says, don't you get me in a war with China over and get me direct conflict uh, with China over Taiwan. Then later on in the game, the president says, I'm tired of China taking stuff. I want the momentum shifted. So we said, okay. And he said, get me an island we can take. So that led to, well, we don't want to get in direct conflict. So how about if we do a demonstration to show how quickly we could land Marines in a coalition environment and had the game gone on, we were ready to go in and quickly show China how quickly we could take back a small island. And by the way, this can continue to roll. But to all the previous points, this just all played out nicely because we were able to communicate with all our allies and all this kind of business. Without it, I'm not sure we'd have been able to do half of what we got done. So a lot of to all the points made by Kelly, by Mike, and by Kanahara-san on communication and a clarity of policy. Thank you. No, thanks, Admiral Green. Uh, Ambassador Scherer? Thanks, Admiral. Um, at the end of the game, one of my Chinese counterparts, Roy Kamphausen, pointed out to me a flaw in the American diplomatic approach to the Chinese, which was that uh, we never really leveled an explicit threat um, to the Chinese. We never told them that if they stay on Itu Aba, it will fundamentally alter US-China bilateral relations and the US relationship with Taiwan. And that's what we should have said at the outset of the senior level diplomacy with the Chinese. And Roy suggested to me in his comments that the Chinese might have backed down if we had leveled such a threat. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot of, uh, as usual in these matters, there, there, there are a lot of uh, uh, positions being taken uh, without uh, quite knowing <laughs> what the effect was going to be on the other side. And that was, and that was good. Uh, I think um, we're, we're getting close to the witching hour here. Uh, Chris Rodman, do you see any other, uh, any other participants we should, uh, or recognize? Yes, yes sir. Um, there was a, a good question there from uh, Nabe in Tokyo about um, the need to increase communication in peacetime between the ROC and U.S. allies such as Japan. And also, I wanted to point out that Mr. Nishi is online with a different name, so we could unmute him if that was something maybe he could comment on. Okay. Um, well, let, let's bring, uh, let's bring uh, Watanabe-san into the con conversation. Uh, uh, no, you, you saw, Nabe, that uh, one of the strong recommendations of the of the game was that we increase trilateral uh, trilateral consultation among the United States, the ROK, and Korea using an expanded allied coordination me mechanism. Are, are you uh, suggesting uh, even further uh, tr trilateral consultations or maybe quadrilateral consultations uh, in peacetime before a crisis happens? 
Oh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So uh, it's good to see you. Um, you know, my question is basically the actually the other the think tank in Tokyo, my friends in Taiwan always are suggesting we need to discussion, we need uh, more communication before things are happening. I think uh, the, so that's one of the reasons that I asked the question. Uh, and uh, probably communication uh, uh, peacetime before things is uh, happening. I think uh, very important, but uh, unfortunately, unlike ROK, unlike uh, um, ROC, Taiwan is very sensitive for us, even us, non-governmental uh, organization to discuss. Of course, we can do, do but uh, government level, very sensitive. So I think a really serious case is needed to share with uh, people in Japan. So uh, that's my question. Right. Um, I, I can take a shot at uh, part of the answer since I was have been involved in, in some of those dialogues myself. And um, the United States has and Taiwan have managed to increase their uh, their communications without changing the formal structure of their one China policies. And, and as you know, that 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 concerns things like uh, level of uh, official visitors uh, between the between the countries, uh, military arrangements, and so on. But even within that structure, the communication between Taiwan and the United States has uh, has increased uh, remarkably as the uh, as the threat from China has increased. My feeling is that the Japan has has not. Uh, been able to increase its negotiation with Taiwan to the to the same extent that it is more restricted, uh, sort of like the United States was in the uh, in in around 2000, 15 years or, or so. So I think the main pull to uh, to the kind of consultation that you talked about involving Taiwan is uh, is, is a set of Japanese decisions uh, with the Re with the Republic of Korea. Uh, as we as we all know, the primary the primary bar to trilateral uh, coordination, even at the military level, is uh, is the uh, political uh, dispute now between um, the United States between uh, Korea, South Korea, and and Japan, and that and that and that uh, sometimes does affect uh, the degree to which uh, Korean officials can talk with. Uh, uh, Americans and Japanese military officials in a trilateral setting, but so I I think we need progress from Korea on the one hand and from um, Japan on the other hand to make a reality of quadrilateral or even trilateral cooperation. I'd say uh, uh, Kanahara-san probably has the most experience in this field as well. Do you have any other any comments on that, Nobu? Uh, can we un unmute uh, Kanahara-san? Yes, yes. Sorry, uh, we should not provoke provoke the Chinese jingoistic military hardliners <laughs> openly, because <laughs> they can they can they can they can be encouraged by our reaction to that. But the thing is, China is rising, and their military power is far bigger than ours. Military budget is four times bigger than Japan today. The economy is, is three times bigger than us today. And today, Japan U.S. alliance is stronger than China. Ten years later. 20 years later, until they peak out. We have to be ready for that. In the meantime, Taiwan is more and more vulnerable. And we need a quiet, very quiet, very quiet, very quiet communications. And maybe Americans are, leak Americans are fearful of our leaking. <laughs> it's, it leaks very easily. <laughs> so that is a true, true maybe concern on the American side, but the situation is getting worse and worse. And we need a very quiet communications among the three. Korea is very difficult to engage. They are even difficult to engage on our side too. They are very much, this, this government is particular. They're very much focusing on the coexistence and peaceful sort of talks with dialogue with North Koreans. That is their priority. And they have no intention to be engaged in anybody else's con the conflicts in particular against China. They're very fearful of China. And it, it is not easy to engage Koreans in, in the outside peninsula. And so it is only Japan, Australia, and the United States. And the, to cope with the rising China, 
uh, we have to do this very carefully and quietly. Oh, th thank you very much. Um, well, but before I turn it over to uh, Chris Rodman to to uh, wrap up, I, I, I would say that although China's military budget is four times Japan's, it is not greater than the combination of the uh, American defense budget, the Japanese defense budget, the, the uh, Republic of Korea's defense budget, Taiwan's defense budget, and as well as uh, others uh, that China can uh, antagonize and uh, turn into a uh, and turn into a coalition against its uh, aggressive action, and that's the uh, and that's the um, the danger that, that China China runs. But at any rate, I, let me finish by uh, thanking all who uh, joined us in this call, and also especially those who uh, spent three days of their lives uh, in Suffolk, Virginia, uh, working on working on this tabletop exercise, and then uh, helping us with the comments and their their wisdom afterwards. Thanks to all of you. And uh, let me turn it back over to uh, Chris Rodman. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, Admiral, I want to thank you for being, of course, our moderator today, but also for leading the uh, Pacific Trident Tabletop Series for several years. It's been a, a huge success, I think, as evidenced by the great uh, crowd that we've had turn out today for this event. Uh, I also, of course, want to thank uh, the President and Chairman of Sasakawa USA, Dr. Satira Akimoto, for allowing us to put on the event and also this event. And I want to thank uh, all the panelists who joined us today for this event and, of course, the guests. Finally, I want to thank uh, the Lockheed Martin Lighthouse, uh, the Center for Innovation, for allowing us to hold the event there uh, for several years. It's just an absolutely tremendous facility, and we couldn't have done it without such a great facility. And that is all I have today. Thank you very much for joining us.